Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Eric, and I hope you're doing very well today. We've got a lot to cover, so let's jump right into it. If you haven't seen any of this before, this is my blockchain project. I have been working on this for a few months now, and I've made some pretty good progress. But I've taken a week off and just thought about the project some, and I want to do sort of a reset on it. So I'm going to do the entire project again from scratch today on a live stream. So there are a couple reasons why I'm going to do this. Uh, first of all, the source code for this is going to be available on GitHub. There is a link in the description and it will bring you here. I'm currently on the working branch, but for today we are going to be creating a new branch which I will be pushing to as we go. So if you enjoy this, feel free to leave a little star. I always appreciate that. But let's jump back into it. So why am I going to restart my project from scratch? Well, first of all, hindsight is 2020. There's always a sense of how I would have done it if I could do it again. And I can do it again. So I'm going to take the opportunity to take everything I've learned and put it all together in one package. So from an artistic standpoint, it gives me the opportunity to really perfect my package, perfect my product. And from an educational standpoint for you guys, it gives me the opportunity to take all of the little concepts that I have been covering along the way and put them all together in one place. So in order to build this project, it has taken quite a bit of research for me. And I want to get all of that research together in one spot so it's easier for other people to find in the future. So those are our goals for today. So let's jump into it. I'm, by the way, we are doing all of this in the C programming language and I'm not really sure where to put the skill level here. So I'm going to be thorough in my explanations of things, but I'm also going to be fast. So. In theory, this should be applicable for any skill level, but the newer you are to the subjects, the more times you might want to review the video. So with that in mind, let's jump in. We're going to be moving kind of fast. Okay, so this is the project as it stands, and you can see that I have a number of different files here. And there's a lot that I like in here and a lot that we are pretty much just going to be copying over. But there are some important things that I want to change, one of which is actually inspired by the contents of this folder, the source folder. So I'm going to be talking more about C libraries later as we go. For now though, I just want to briefly touch on these two libraries that I was using. This is Mongoose and SQLite. And the property of these I want to focus in on is that they are embedded libraries. And what I mean by that is that they aren't installed system-wide. So I can't, in other projects, reference the things that come with Mongoose or SQLite. What I have to do is actually bring these two files in. And this is the entirety of the Mongoose library. And this is the entirety of the SQLite library. It's a single file. and I am actually kind of inspired by this at the moment. So first of all, I'm the kind of person that gets inspired by single file implementations of large projects. So, all right, there's that. I learned that about me today. But also, I really like the singular cohesion that this offers. I like the idea of the entire project essentially being a single train of thought. So maybe this is a great idea, maybe this is a terrible idea, but I'm going to try and replicate this and do my project all as a single file. Now in the future, what I'm actually thinking for this is, well, blockchains typically come with a white paper, and I've, I've never read the white papers for blockchains, and I've never written one or anything like that, but what I'm thinking is essentially when you're working with C, the .h file is usually the definition of something, where the .c is the implementation of something. And what you're trying to do there is separate the what from the how. Typically, when someone uses your library, they don't care how it's doing things, they care what it does. So that's what the h file is for, whereas the c is the how it is done, the actual nuts and bolts of how it accomplishes those goals. And that format actually suits itself well to 
a kind of essay even. So I'm thinking of actually in the form of comments embedding an essay into these files as well. But that's something I would do off stream just as an interest. So let's go ahead and get into the dramatic moment where we delete everything. <laughs> so I'm just going to double check that we are on the correct branch. So I'm going to do git status and we are on the branch single file, which is what I like. And here's a great thing about git. So I have created this branch single file for this live stream. And what this is going to allow me to do is select everything in this folder and just delete it. But first I want to move that out here because I actually want to keep those. But then all of that is gone. Okay, <laughs> a scary thing to do, yes. But since I'm using Git, all of that is saved in my working branch. So I can just revert back to that later if this whole thing is a bust and it doesn't work. So no problem there. And I'm going to be referencing this GitHub page as we go. Since I've already written a lot of this code, I am not going to reinvent the wheel. I'm probably going to copy most, if not all of it, but we'll talk about it as we go. So let's create our files and let's also reorganize this so that it makes a little more sense. Okay, so I'm going to need to create a new directory in here and we'll call it blockchain. Okay, so I think there's a little problem here and yep, it deleted the reference, but it didn't delete. Interesting, Get rid of that. There we go. Okay. And within this folder, I'm going to keep this SRC folder. Now this is just the Mongoose and SQLite embedded libraries. And as I explained earlier, you need these two files in order to use those. So I'm just going to bring them in. We're not going to talk about them very much yet. Just know that that's what that folder is for. And we'll get to that in a little bit. We are going to create our single file, well, our two files, our .h and .c file. We'll just call it blockchain. Now, let's talk about the interface. So when I did the original project and when I made this version of it, I was thinking about the nuts and bolts fundamentals of how the project would work and the interface at the same time. And this ended up causing some confusion of how things would be done and it made things more difficult than it needed to be. So I'm going to take a different approach today rather than, let's see if I can find it. I have this interfaces folder and I was designing everything around this command line interface. Now, rather than doing that today, I'm going to ignore the topic of interfaces altogether. And we are just going to focus on the fundamentals of how things work and getting things working. So the final product of this is actually going to be more like, do I have one in here somewhere? Yes, this, a static library or a .a file. And that's going to contain basically all of the functions and definitions that we create today. And from there, I'll be able to implement whatever interface I want, or you can imp implement whatever interface you want. So this is an open source project. So feel free to download it, expand on it, do whatever you like with it. It's, I, I would love to hear about your projects with it. And yeah, so <laughs> feel free to contribute. But anyway, we're going to try and create a static library that just contains the fundamental tools for doing the things we want to be able to do. And then later I can come in and we'll implement whatever interfaces we need. Okay, so that is the goal here. And we have our two files, .h and .c. It's kind of intimidating to look at these, honestly, because I'm going to have to put the entire blockchain project into these two files. And this is what we have. Okay, so we're going to delete that include. We're going to include some of the standard I'm instinctually going this way for this, so I'm gonna actually move it. Let's open the equivalent file here. Okay, as you can see here, I am using a number of parts of the standard library, as well as parts from OpenSSL, my own personal library, and here are the two source files. So there are a lot of different libraries going on here. And what we're going to do is include those one at a time as they come up. So we know what they're being used for. Okay. 
And then I also have defined some constants here. And these are, well, we'll come to those later. So this is something I was thinking of doing as a configuration file. I haven't gotten to that yet, so we'll, we'll approach those as we go. So let's start off. Let's start off with kind of the fundamental unit of a blockchain, and that is going to be our block object. So we need something to represent our actual blocks. And here, if I have our block.h file, I want to talk about the difference between an abstract and a concrete object. So first of all, those are terms that I made up, so don't look for them in a textbook, but let me show this to you in Python. If we go to the desktop, Okay, so let's create a block in Python. How would you do this? It would typically be something like this. We would have a class, we would call it block. We can spell correctly. And then we would have some init function. And we'd pass it some properties and we would set it's like self.hash equals whatever hash we pass it. Well, that actually doesn't make sense. So we'll say previous hash and we'll make it that so you see where i'm going with this we would essentially pass in all the properties we want here and then we would set them equal to it here and i cut out the hash because we would probably calculate the hash based on those properties rather than uh, telling it what the hash is but the point here is that this is an abstract object. And what I mean by that is that you couldn't tell me what this looks like in memory. So what the hash of this, well, okay, I need to go into hashes first, but let's, let's, let me put the hashes aside for a second there. I was getting ahead of myself. What I want to get across here is that you don't know exactly what this looks like in memory. And it has the properties that it does because of how, because we tell it it has those properties. We say that it's previous equals the previous. It's not inherent to the object itself. Now, this is different in a programming language like C. So I'm defining this as a struct. And basically what I am going to end up doing is putting arrays in here. And I'm here's where my audience is coming into play. So if you are new to C, this might be quite a jump so basically the point i'm making is that when i declare an array in c i'm going to be given bytes i'm going to be given a space in physical memory and so when i define my block object it has a definite space in memory and i can tell you what goes into every single one of those bytes so here i have an array of 64 bytes for the previous hash and so the first 64 bytes of this structure are that. And so it's a concrete object. It is literally this. And this is how it looks in physical memory. And that's what I mean by concrete. Okay, so that's going to be important for us in building a blockchain because of the different types of cryptographic functions we need to use. So as part of it, let's, let's do a little... Again, I'm trying to keep my audience in mind here. I, I'm not sure if the viewers here are familiar with the concepts of blockchain or are familiar with these concepts in C. So I want to be thorough and actually explain everything for people. So the way this is going to work, I think the best way to show this is actually looking at our object here. So here is, well, these are the headers for a block. And the fields that we want to talk about are the previous hash, and the nuns. So what we're going to basically do is each block is going to be given a unique code or a hash. And this hash is going to be unique to that block and dependent on that block. So we get the hash by manipulating the data of the block. Okay, we'll, we'll just leave it in the abstract. We'll go into the details later. So this is going to be a, like the term is typically a digest of the block. So a summary of the block in a numeric form. And that's going to be its hash or ID. 
And what we're doing is essentially creating a linked list. So in each block, we are going to embed the hash of the previous block, thus linking it to another block in the chain. And because the hash is dependent on the contents of the block, when we hash our new block, we are essentially creating an ID that is tied to it being that previous hash. So we are kind of locking it into the chain this way. And so we have these, these objects are going to contain two things. First are these fields that are going to be used to actually link it into the chain. And then we're going to have an additional field for whatever kind of data we're going to put in. Now a block, different blockchains will contain different kinds of data. So the Bitcoin blockchain, for instance, always contains transactions. Every block in the Bitcoin blockchain contains transaction data. Ethereum contains smart contracts. So every block in the Ethereum blockchain contains a smart contract. Well, I actually, I, I, don't hold me to that one. I'm not sure if every block, that, that might not be correct, but they do smart contracts. So at least some of the blocks on Ethereum contain smart contracts. So we have a field for data. And right now we're not going to talk about what our data is. We are just going to say that there is a field for data. And this is where the nuances of your particular blockchain are going to come in. Okay, so a lot of different things are in play here. We have our concrete objects written in C, which gives us a actual physical memory pattern for these things. And then we have this abstract linked list structure that locks all of these blocks together. And then we have data in the block. Okay, so what is the point of all of this? What are we getting from doing this? Essentially, the goal is to create an immutable ledger of events or data. Essentially, you want a immutable database. So with each block that I add to this, in order to change any block in the chain, I would have to change every single subsequent block. Okay, so since our hashes are linked together from one block to the next, and since the hash is itself dependent upon the contents of the block, the hash of the previous being part of those contents, if I change anything in this block, it would change this block's hash, therefore changing this block's hash and then this block's hash. So it's this cascading effect of changes that gives our blockchain its security. And we are accomplishing that through these hashes. Okay, and the purpose of accomplishing that is so that we can store our data in this immutable ledger. Okay, and our data can be whatever we want it to be. Okay, so let's go ahead and build that. <laughs> that was quite the introduction to that. Let's start actually building it. So I'm going to just define a struct and I'm going to call it the block. This is our base unit. Now, I. I here we're kind of thinking about the interface again. As I said, there are we're kind of ignoring the concept of an interface, but at the same time, we're really not. We are actually going to be thinking of an interface, and that interface is going to be a C library or a C API. And so I want to get into a good habit with my naming conventions. So when someone is going to use this, how is it going to look on their end? So since it's an API, they're going to most likely be using it through a, um, an IDE like this. And I'm going to take a page out of the book of Mongoose and SQLite. And let me show you what I think they do really well. Everything is named in such a way that it's really easy to find. So let's see. Well, let me, let me show this to you in, in the wild. <laughs> shall we say. Okay, we'll include Mongoose. And if I type in MG, these are all of the different things that Mongoose has to offer. Everything begins with MG, and that makes it really easy to find everything I'm looking for. There are all, that's where it stops. Those are all of the things you can do with Mongoose. So that is sort of the thing I'm going for. And I'm going to actually type def these things. So you would use these as actual data types. So we're actually going to say type def struct block. But what I want to do is say blockchain object 
block. So my naming convention is going to be that everything is going to begin with all caps blockchain. That just makes everything easy to find. Then I'm going to have a, another set of identifiers, however deep I need to go, that just tell me layer by layer what I'm making. So uh, this is going to be an object, so I'll put obj there. And then for any other objects I create, I'll use the same pattern. So I'll have blockchain obj block, blockchain obj whatever else. Makes those things easier to find. Okay, so we are going to type def this, that struct, and we're going to give it exactly the same name. And this just makes it so that the user doesn't have to type in struct all the time and they can just use this as a native data type. Okay, so that gives us that. And within the block, we are going to have actually just two fields. The first is going to be the headers for a block. These are the components that essentially link it to the other blocks in the chain and give us our security features. Now, as you can see, I have some additional fields in here and we will get to those as we go. But for now, let's just say that we have block headers too. So we're going to do the same thing. Type def struct block. Well, we have to use our naming convention. Blockchain obj block headers. Oops. Okay, so we have our headers, and that is going to be the first field in our block. So we'll say that, and we'll call it, we need to give it a name here. I think, we, yeah, we, we sorry, I'm forgetting my, my syntax, <laughs> silly me. And then we're going to have one additional field, and here is where I'm going to do another type def, and this one is going to be a little bit interesting. So this is something that I personally, I kind of wish C just had this by default. So let me just show it to you. Type def. So unsigned character. I want to call that byte. Okay, so when I am working with C, one of the reasons I like working with C and that I am choosing to work with C on this particular project is that it gives me access to raw bytes. And that is the concrete object I was talking about earlier. And the reason I want those raw bytes is it allows me to make things have natural properties rather than artificial ones. We'll see that in a bit. But they, the most literal form of a byte in C is the unsigned character which is just a weird name for it. <laughs> just, just call it a byte. So I, I just rename it. That's, that's the whole point there. So when I say byte, you say unsigned character. All right. So we're going to have a field for data. And here what I'm going to do is say byte data. And that's it. I'm just going to give one byte for the data field. Now that doesn't seem very useful. But the idea here is actually to make it so that this block can be of any size. Okay, our headers are what link it to other blocks in the chain. Let me close these tabs. That's, that's going to bother me. Okay, so the headers are what link it to other blocks in the chain. The headers define our security features. The data is whatever we want it to be. So by establishing one byte here, essentially what I'm saying is that if we have this amount of space in memory, all of this, Okay, our headers take up this amount of space. Since it is a concrete object, this is exactly how much space the headers are, and I can easily delineate these and say, well, this is the previous hash, this is the nonce, this is whatever else, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, that's the benefit of it being concrete. And then our data field, we're just assigning one byte to start, but actually we can allocate as much space as we want as we want for this entire block. So we can just use the memory address of this data field to put anything we want to in a block. So essentially what this is going to be is a universal blockchain. Blockchain that can store transactions, it can store smart contracts, it can store YouTube videos. I could put my live stream into this blockchain if I wanted to. So that is kind of the philosophy here. We are kind of making a universal blockchain. And we do this by 
using concrete objects. We get our headers, locking it into the chain to have a concrete size. And then we just say everything after that is going to be the rest of the block. That's our data. So the end of this will be a file. So I actually have an example from a previous iteration here. So the end product is this block. And what I can tell you is that this block has, if I just do get properties, get info, it has a concrete size. The first, I think, thousand bytes or so are the headers. And I can just use this literal file as my block and it contains all of the data. Okay, so that's kind of our end goal here. Now, what fields are we going to have in the headers? Well, as we discussed, it's going to have a previous hash, but we haven't really talked about that in detail yet. So let's leave that alone for now. First thing I want to do is actually make this a little bit more concrete. So like I said, let's say I, if I put some fields in here, let's say I give it a, um, an integer x, we're going to give it a character y, and we're going to give it another integer z. Okay. I can tell you what this is going to look like in memory because an integer is exactly four bytes, character is one byte, and then we have another four bytes for the next integer. So this struct, when saved in memory or saved in a file, is going to look like this. We have four bytes, one byte, and then four bytes. But that's not quite how it works. So it saves it according to how it wants to read it. And your CPU wants to read things in chunks rather than one byte at a time. So if our CPU is going to read this four bytes at a time, we would read that, and then we would read that, which cuts our integer into sections, which we don't want. So what this is actually going to do is allocate additional space and it's going to create what's called a word or padding. So this blank padding essentially serves so that our CPU will read this variable, excuse me, this variable in one clock cycle, this variable in the next clock cycle, and then this variable in the last clock cycle. So our final product is not quite what we expect. And also when I pass this between different machines, it's going to change. So as if, if my CPU doesn't have the same word size that your CPU has, this structure will be different. And as we were discussing, the hash of the block is what is linking it into the chain and is dependent on the contents of the block. So we can't have the shape of these changing from machine to machine. So what I'm going to do is just assign it one little property and that is going to be It has the attribute packed, and that is simply going to, did I do that right? Let me see, <laughs> how is it done here? Yeah, yeah, I did that, right? So yes, this, is, this attribute basically tells the compiler not to do padding. So our, that is now what our structure will look like. And it will look like that no matter what CPU you're using, assuming your compiler supports this attribute, which most mainstream ones do. So we are good to go there. And we also want to do the same thing here. Whoops. Okay, so now this whole structure has its exact layout and memory. And now all we need to do is fill in the fields that we want but we're going to fill those in as we go and as we start covering some more concepts on the blockchain, okay? So, which of those do we wanna start with? We have our block. Yeah, I think we should get a little bit more into hashes. Let me grab some water real quick. I will be right back and
Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. So let's jump in and start actually working with the hashes of these blocks. So what we're going to use here is a library called OpenSSL. So I'm going to just include it up top. And we're going to need a few components from OpenSSL. You know, actually, before we do anything more on the blocks, I want to set out the same structure for our accounts. So our blocks are kind of the base unit. This is what we are exchanging on the blockchain. But we also want to know like, who created the block and who is exchanging them. So we need a way for users to have accounts. And this is one of the key concepts in blockchain because since it is decentralized, we can't do an account the way we would do on a traditional client server setup. So if you think about how, if you're running a website, for instance, so let's, let's take a look, GitHub right here. I have an account on GitHub. And this is uh, another great example of an abstract object. So what is my GitHub account physically? What is it? It's, it doesn't, it's not physically anything. It's, it's a username in a database tied with the hopefully hash of a password in a database. And when I log in, it just formats the page a little bit differently for that. My account physically is not anything. And since there is a single server here, and I trust the single server, that works. But on a blockchain where it's decentralized, we can't have something like that. We can't have a trusted server that will allow us to log in with the username and password because the whole idea is that we don't need to trust anybody on the network. So we need a different kind of account, a concrete account, a physical account. And we're going to do that with something called an EVP, or not an EVP, a RSA key pair. Okay, so a account on our blockchain is going to actually be two physical files. The way this works is actually very similar to HTTP. So when I go onto my GitHub thing, you see that little lock here. This is a certificate. Maybe I shouldn't actually be showing that on a live stream. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe that was a terrible idea. But anyway, I have the little lock here. And this is actually exactly the same thing. It is a public and private key. The way it works is, well, this is an encryption technique. So encryption is where we are basically well, encryption is exactly what you expect, okay? I'm, I'm defining it here because I'm going to define something later that's not what you're expecting. Encryption is where I want to send you a secret message. So I use some code to encrypt it, I send it to you, and then you can decrypt it somehow. And I always get these backwards, so let's actually Google it. I got this backwards at an important time the other day, so I should have remembered. But anyway, asymmetric versus symmetric. I think I spelled it wrong. Symmetric uses a single key, asymmetric uses two. Okay, so we're using two key. This is an asymmetric encryption. What that means is that we have two keys. So one of these keys is for decrypting and the other is for encrypting. So you can see that I have this one. Let's say this one is mine and this is my public one. So let's say I give this one to you. What I'm going to do is take a file. So I can take this file, for instance, and I can encrypt this file using my private key. Then I can send you the file and you can use my public key to decrypt it. And the idea here is basically that it's a one way channel. So if I encrypt it with the private key, I can only decrypt it with the public key. And if I encrypt it with the public key, I can only decrypt it with the private key. And this is going to give us a number of really useful features. So we're not really interested in the encryption so much as we are interested in the ability to create what is called a digital signature. So using these key pairs, since you have my public, I can create, in addition to, let's say, this file, I can create a second file. That's called a signature. Uh, and that is going to verify that this file was authored by whoever has this private key. Okay? So that is the basis of our account here. We can use this to guarantee authorship. 
So let's create an account object. Now this one is going to be a little bit different. Since our concrete object is this physical file, we don't actually need our struct to work the same way. We can be a little bit more abstract here. So for example, let's say I, I'm gonna move down a little bit. Let's type def a struct, and I'm going to call it blockchain obj count, and I capitalize, and rest of it, we're just gonna leave that blank for now, and we'll call it account. Okay, now, in the block headers and the block itself, it was really important that we knew the byte structure of it, because as we will see later, we will that, that determines the hash of the block. So knowing that byte structure and having this packed attribute and the finite memory space for it was really important for our blocks, but for our accounts, that's kind of handled for us through the public and private keys. And really all we need is a way to load the public and private key and to use them within the blockchain. And that's where OpenSSL is going to come in. So OpenSSL contains, let's get out our count file here. Okay, so all I'm going to do is have some pointers, some memory addresses. So let me get rid of mongoose here because we aren't actually using that yet. So our first include is going to be OpenSSL EVP dot H. EVP stands for envelope, by the way. <laughs> I think uh, another, uh, another uh, viewer told me that, and another person told me that, actually. So I am stamping my belief in the, uh, it stands for envelope, <laughs> so we'll go with that. And this is going to basically give us a way to load in our public and private key. It's going to give us ways to create them and use them and do all sorts of different things with them. But really what I want right now is actually the data type, EVP e key, yeah. So our account is just going to be two pointers. So uh, this EVP P key for a public and private key. When we're in the actual C program of our blockchain, when we load in these two files, we need a place to store them. And this struct is going to store those. Okay, so I'm gonna, let me try and tie a few threads together here. <laughs> so I made a big deal of the byte structure here and how this is going to be different. So since I'm using a pointer here, this struct is actually only going to be a few bytes long, even though the EVPP key is going to require many, many bytes. Okay, this is a memory address, a pointer, rather than the actual physical object. So this account is more of an abstract data type, but in this circumstance, that's okay. We want an abstract data type here because our concrete object is the file. And the data type we're using within C is just something to load the file and to reference the contents of those files quickly. Okay, so we're gonna have one for the public key, and then we're gonna have another for the private key. And that's it, that's our whole account. We can do everything we need to from there, and we'll use the OpenSSL package to do all of that. Okay, so we have two things in play now. We have our blocks and our accounts. So what we have established in our blockchain is something to transmit data within and a way of identifying who we are transmitting it to, who authored it, and basically we have identity on the blockchain. But really at this point, we've just said that we have those things. We haven't actually implemented anything to do anything with that. So let's actually jump in and start doing some work here. We need to go into the .c file in just a second, but let's start off with creating an account. So I'm going to define a new function. And what should this function return? Maybe 
boolean i don't know yet so let's say void for now and this is going to be a way to create an account that's going to be the first thing we want to do now i started with creating the fundamentals of our block so that i could really get into the uh, concrete versus abstract objects but it's a little bit awkward now because I don't have anything defined in them. And the reason for that is that many of the fields that we're going to define in the block are dependent on us having an account first. So that's why I'm going to actually implement the account first, even though I defined the block first. So it's a, a little bit of an interesting ride here. And keep in mind that I am making all of this from a perspective of hindsight. So this video might make a lot more sense if you watch it a second or third time. Um, if you know what the project looks like at the end, it's a lot easier to see why I am kind of jumping from thing to thing right now. Okay, and if you, if you have any questions while we're going, feel free to leave them in the chat. I'm happy to answer anything. Okay, so let's create our create account function. Now, since I don't know what I want it to return at this point, I am going to just leave it as void. I have a feeling boolean is appropriate, but let's leave that alone for now. And what are we going to call this? So we're going to give it our typical uh, blockchain start, but what should the second prefix, if anything, be? Um, function seems appropriate. So let's do that function with on accounts. Well, let's just do. Let's do that for now, and I might come back and adjust some of these naming conventions later. But, you know, that's one of the things that I really wanted to accomplish by doing this all in one sitting, is to have consistent naming conventions. So I might change them later, but at least I'm going to be consistent now. Okay, so what are we going to pass to this? Probably nothing for now. Why am I doing that? <laughs> this seems like a really, really small thing to add into the code here. Well, again, our .h is the definition. And I'm thinking about this from the perspective of someone who's going to read this in the future. They're going to want to know how to create an account. And I just want to show them, here's your function. And then in our .c file, we can actually implement this. So let's do this. And I'm going to have to leave the face cam off for a second so I can recharge my Mac. So <laughs> toodaloo to the face. All right, we're all plugged in. All right, so let's define this. How are we going to create an account? Well, if we look at our .c file over here, we can see that I already did it, so I don't have to reinvent the wheel. Let's see. Create. Okay, let's talk about the basic structure of how this works. So we're going to be using OpenSSL here. And OpenSSL, it's interesting the way we need to do this. So first of all, we already talked about the EVPP key being the loaded version of this. This is the active version of a file or of a key file. Okay, for the generation of a key, we need to do a few steps. So first, we need to actually generate the private key. Okay, this is my private key. I didn't mean to open it in this. Let's cancel that. Let's close that. Open this in... Uh, let's just do this. Okay, this is my private key. And why am I comfortable showing it to you? Well, because I've encrypted it. Okay, so we are going to basically try to create this. And there are different formats that we can create it in. But what we want for now is to focus on this weird set of characters in here. Um, this is the actual key. And this represents a really, really, really big prime number. And I'm not going to get into the details of how the RSA encryption algorithm works, but suffice to say, we use two really big related prime numbers. And through those, we are able to extract the uh, properties that we extract. Suffice to say that. Okay, so we start off by generating this first prime number. 
and then through it we are going to extract the public key okay so what happens over here is that we are first going to uh, create the RSA key and we need to set how long it is so I like to do 4096 bits because it's a little bit more secure than the default so let's go ahead and do a lot of this we're going to create an EVP P key pointer key equals EVP key new okay and then we are going to have a context so OpenSSL does this a lot and actually a lot of encryption algorithms do this quite frequently we start off by defining a context for whichever algorithm we're going to use this could be uh, the RSA algorithm the SHA-256 whatever algorithm we are using we're going to set its context and then we are going to update it and set it to a final state. So, you know what, let's just, we just copy and paste this. I don't think so. I think that's a bad idea, actually. So, let me see. Am I passing anything in here? No, I don't think so. So let's just define our context. DCTX, PKey CTX. And that is a pointer, and we just set it to new. Okay, our key is going to be key, and engine E is going to be, oh, my mistake. We're going to use the EVP P key RSA algorithm as our context. And for our engine, we're just going to pass it null. We're not worried about the engine that it is using. Okay, so what we have done is we have created a place to store our new key, and we have created the context in which we are going to create that new key. The property of which we are interested in is this RSA. We are going to be using the RSA algorithm. And I've made a few mistakes here, so incompatible integer to pointer new ID I am my mistake I did I new ID there we go okay so now we just have some unused variables that's no problem okay so we've created a place to store the key and we've created a context in which to generate the key so now what we are going to do is actually initialize the context okay so we are going to what is that called again evp p key gen init and we're going to in, initialize our context and once we have initialized the context now we get to set the size of it and by default i believe it is 2000 what would it be 4000 4 2048 and I'm going to double that and use 4096 because that's a little bit more secure. The bigger the number you use as your, uh, your RSA key, the more secure it is. So let's use 4096. So I'm just gonna copy and paste the name because you know, uh, even though the, using the library names like that makes it easier to find them, sometimes it's uh, they're, a bit, they're a bit verbose, as you can see, and ours might end up that way as well. So we're going to do that to our CTX, and we're going to give it 4,096 bits. Okay, so that's a pretty secure key. I'm sorry, I whacked the mic. I don't know what that sounded like for you guys. Okay, and then we can actually just generate it. So EVP keygen. Gonna have to copy and paste it again and it might be that i'm actually haven't included the proper function yes see i haven't included the function evp.h okay so we actually need over on our h file well it's right there what do you mean i haven't included it it's right there <laughs> okay that's peculiar Anyway, we're going to use our key gen on the context and we'll store the output in the address of key. Is that correct? 
Yeah, this is a pointer to a pointer. That's I've I I know what a pointer to a pointer is, but I'm not quite sure why you would want to use that in this circumstance. So here's kind of one of the downsides to um, I guess it's not a downside. This is the the entire point of separating out things into .h files. I don't know why it would need a pointer to a pointer here. See how it's already a pointer up here, and we're sending the address of that memory address, that's a strange thing to do. Anyway, regardless, that has actually generated our key. And so now what we need to do is actually save it and extract the public key out of it. Okay, so let's see, how am I doing it here? Uh, I'm using a global, and this is something that I defined Sorry, over here. Yes, okay. So originally I had defined these globals and I'm not quite sure what the best approach is. I think we'll have to kind of do the same thing here. So I'm gonna put them at the beginning and we will we'll think about that as we go. And I don't think it needs to be static anymore since I'm only using a single file. Uh, give me, give me one second here. I've decided to just bring the water to me. <laughs> okay. So now I have generated the key and it's still not like in this. I definitely have that though. Okay, that was, uh, that's bizarre. Anyway, we've generated our key and now we need to actually save it somewhere and we need to extract the public key. Now, here is where the actual format of the key starts to matter. Where am I trying to go? Count.c. Okay. So, there are different formats that we can save these keys in. As you can see here, I'm using this PEM format. And this is a human readable format, kind of. If we look here, we see it starts with uh, begin RSA private key. It tells us that it's encrypted using this particular algorithm. And like that's the hash of my password or something. And here's our actual key. And then it says the end private key, et cetera, et cetera. Basically, it's a human readable version of uh, this number. So that's our PEM format, but that's not the most concise format. The most concise format, of course, would just be the number in raw binary format. So that is the DER format, and we are going to actually want to make use of the DER format throughout the project as we are sending these back and forth, because it's a really efficient way of transmitting the keys but there's a benefit to the PEM format as well. And that is this right here. When we save it in this human readable format, we have the option to encrypt it. And that gives us the ability to have a password. So when logging into the blockchain, if we save our private key in a PEM format, we will still be able to have passwords on accounts, which will, if nothing else, really sell the login experience. So we want to save it as a PEM file and OpenSSL gives us a really easy way to do that. Once we have generated our key up here, we can just actually write it to a file and we can specify an algorithm to encrypt it with. So this is going to be our whole username and password setup all in one just through these keys, which is really great and actually uh, one of the most robust sort of login systems that you can do. For one thing, it takes the onus off of the, uh, the server to keep things secure. So 
you are responsible for keeping your private key private. If, if, if it gets out, then that's your responsibility. No one's responsible for its security other than you. And also, it's really just one of the most secure algorithms out there. So storing, storing your account as a key pair is the only vulnerability is this file. So long as you keep this file safe, nothing any it's impractical to break the account anyway so we get our our private key and we need to save it to a file and what i was doing here is basically concatenating all these things together to make it into a file so let's think how do, how do we want to do that i could define this global up here and just let the users decide how to do it and where do I ask their name? Ask their name elsewhere. So what I did in this original function was have them specify a username, and then we would use that as the file name here. So am I going to do that within the file? And how am I going to prompt them for a username? So maybe it would be best to actually just pass the username in. So we'll have character pointer username. And I'm just going, to, yeah, let's, let's keep it as username. It's the full, that's a, a good variable name. Okay, so then finding the path would be exactly the same. It still doesn't like that. It still doesn't like this. I... Not sure what to do about that because it's it's right there. <laughs> Maybe there's another open SSL thing that I need to include, but we'll see. Okay. Uh let me actually check on that. Which ones do we use? Probably well, either way, I'm going to need PEM. So as I said, we're currently trying to write to a PEM file. So we're going to need this PEM.h. And I'm betting that the thing that it's looking for is in the RSA.h rather than EBP.h. So let's include those as well. And hopefully that will save my sanity. Okay. So what was I doing before that little tangent? Not there. Objects. Count. Right, we're trying to open the file. So, you see, the thing I don't like about this is that I, I want this create account function to just create an account and having this in here is a bit superfluous. So this part creates the path to the file by concatenating the profile path, the name specified, and the .pem extension. And then I try to open that for reading and check if it exists so that I don't overwrite pre-existing accounts. Okay, but ah, that's... That's not creating an account, is it? <laughs> that's that's doing something else. So why is it in the create account function? It doesn't it doesn't belong there. I don't like that. Anyway. Hmm. I could have them here we could specify a path to the file. We could have them pass both together. And we just assume that they know what they're doing. So here's where building this as a library sort of becomes helpful. I can kind of assume more about my user. So this was added largely as a security feature since I was thinking about doing this from a command line interface. So I wanted to check to make sure that the user wasn't going to accidentally overwrite something beforehand. But here, I don't have that problem. So I can actually make the function uh, do no checks. And then I can implement checks later when I actually try and make an interface for this designed for a person to use rather than 
something to be built on top of. So let's do that. I am going to have to concatenate all of those together. And is there a quicker way to do that? Maybe, probably not. Okay, so let's just do it exactly the same way. So I'll have a character path 64 equals zero. Why would I say equals zero, you ask? <laughs> so what I wanna do here is create a a discrete space in memory. So I want actually a character pointer, but I can achieve the same thing by declaring an array. And by declaring an array, I am allocating space on the stack, 64 bytes to be precise, for this particular variable. So and let's let me give you an example side by side. If I do this, that defines basically the same thing. When I refer to path down here, uh, they're basically equivalent. But this has no actual physical memory associated with it yet, okay? Whereas this one has a discrete 64 bytes associated with it. And so it creates the same pointer, but it allows me to give it space in memory. And then it allows me to make sure that space is clean by setting it equal to zero. So that is why I do that there. And Hiru. I don't know what is blockchain, but I am still watching. Can you explain to me what is blockchain? Yes, it would be very difficult to watch this if you don't know what blockchain is. I'm sorry about that. Blockchain is basically a way of creating a immutable ledger of data. So this was something I was showing earlier. This is my block object. And actually, uh, for the people watching at home who are wondering why I stopped building this after this, this will be a good demonstration. So Hero, the blockchain is essentially a way for us to create a database, a way of storing data and sharing data between different machines without trusting one another. So we're going to create an immutable ledger of data. I can create a block and I will basically be able to claim authorship of that block. And you will be able to without validating this with any third party, you will be able to confirm that I created this block. Let me give you a, a concrete example here of why you would use this. So my blockchain in particular is designed to store anything. You can put anything into this block. And I could put this exact live stream into a block. I just download the video, store its bytes in this field, and then I fill out the required elements of the header field. And that is going to log it into the blockchain. And essentially the idea here is basically that I would in the future be able to validate my authorship and ownership of this video because I put it in the blockchain like this. So in the abstract, a blockchain is an immutable ledger of data. And in the specifics, mine is an immutable ledger of any kind of data and basically any kind of content you want. I hope that's enough of an explanation. We are trying to go pretty deep into things here, so I'm going to keep pushing ahead, okay? So I created a space on the stack for us to store the path where we're going to save this key file. And now I just need to stick all of the constituent parts together. So string cat, oh, of course, I don't have the library yet. So here's where I'm going to start needing the string library. So I'm going to, from the standard library, include string.h. This is going to give me access to the string cat function, which is how we concatenate strings in C. I have this blank one to start with. I specify that the result of this function is going to go into the path variable. And what I want to stick onto the end of whatever is currently stored in here is the profile path. And I need to repeat that process for the name, or actually username, and then one more time for the file extension. And that is the path for our key file. Okay, so you know what? You know what? Maybe
Hmm. I'm wondering maybe maybe this function shouldn't actually save it to a file at all. Maybe that should be a separate function altogether. No, I don't think so because this function is to create an account and the account is the file. So since the account is the file, we have to actually create the file to create the account. I think. Let me think. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's I think that makes sense. So we are going to have to create the file here. Um, I'm starting to think that this live stream is going to take much longer than I expected. Okay, <laughs> let's just see how we do. All right, so let's go ahead and create our file. Okay. Uh, yeah, we did that. And should I check to make sure that they don't overwrite it? No, we're not going to do that. We are going to assume that the user knows what they're doing. Yeah, we're going to assume the user knows what they're doing. Okay. So we're going to open that for writing. So file pointer e file equals open, or is it f open? Our file name is going to be path. And we're going to open it in write mode because we are going to create and write to this file. And actually, here is actually another opportunity for something. Let me check something. I wonder if there is a mode where it uh, where it will not overwrite an over a, a, a an existing file. Uh, that could work. File must exist. No, that, that that's the opposite of what we want. No, it will always, there's, it, it does not seem that there's a way. That's unfortunate. We could have done the check right there, but so it shall be. Okay, so and now what we need to do is actually write the contents to that file. So this is done within the context of a check. And I, uh, the if statement is basically to validate that this happens. And I want to implement something special here. So let's, let's approach this one thing at a time. So we're going to use the PEM write public key. And is that the full correct function? Do I need the EX? No, just write private key. Yeah, that's the right one. Okay, so we're going to write this to the file, key file. And the key we want to use is key. The cipher we want to use, okay. So here's where we get to actually use a password. And the 256, the SHA-256 is um, pretty secure. It's, a, the, it's the biggest number in the AES family that's available for this sort of password. So that's going to be the one that I choose. You can use whichever one you want, but I'm gonna use this one. This is where we get the password on our account. And since I'm specifying that as the third argument in the PEM write private key, it will actually automatically prompt me for a password, both when I try to uh, create this account and when I try to log into this account. So by using these PEM files, we actually get an inherent login system as well, which makes this really easy. Anyway. Null, zero, no, null, null, null. Okay, <laughs> we'll just. So let's, let's actually talk about what those were. Um, I guess this, tutor this would be more appropriately titled a complete tutorial for what I know about blockchains because I don't know what the K string and K length are used for. So I am just going to type in null there. I do know what the callback is though, and this one. So the callback is a function that is called 
whenever you try to, or whenever it needs a password, and it will run this function, passing it this variable uh, in order to execute whatever is needed for this password. But again, there's an inherent one baked into just using this so we can set this to null and just stick with the default. Okay. So far so good. Now I do an error check here because if this doesn't work, the whole thing has failed and I want to print out an error message. And yeah, so part of this is that I have yet to extract the public key from this. So I can't just uh, return the result of this and call it boolean and be done with it. So we're going to need to do the check. So if that fails, what are we going to do? We're going to do fprintf and okay why am i using fprintf and the file descriptor standard error here well the reason is that uh, as a library i want this thing to be fairly dynamic i want it to whatever you're trying to use it for at any given time i want this thing to sort of adapt to it so by saying fprintf to standard error instead of just printf meaning print to the screen I am basically allowing the user to redefine standard out, standard in, and standard error so they can use pipes if they so choose or a, a logging system. They can use whatever they want here. And so rather than them having to come into my code and editing where this prints, they can in their code just change what standard error is and get this to go wherever they want. And what do I want to print? Okay, so I'm going to print a message here, and this is one of the keys to writing some good code, is uh, meaningful error messages. So I want to specify that the error is coming from the blockchain project, and that we are getting an error. And now I want to actually describe the error. And I, so I want to say failed to write private key for account percent s for our format and a new line and then i want to pass it the variable username so this is going to format the string for me so it's going to insert my username where this percent s is so it would say for example blockchain error failed to write private key for account eric and yeah that would give us a meaningful error message that tells us basically what to look for and now we can return exit failure. And since we are returning exit failure, this needs to be int. Okay, so that tells us what our return type is. So you can see when I originally created this, I defined it as void void. And through my actual implementation of it, determined what needed to be passed to it and what it was going to return. Now there are other ways you can do that. You can um, define it all out beforehand, but I find that this is often one of the better ways to do it because you kind of see what you need as you need it. All right, so this creates our private key, but now we need to extract and save the public key. And so what we want to do is first clear out our path, and then we want to basically reset it so that we can use it for the private key. And we're going to do it in basically the same way. First, we're going to use memset, and memset is going to take all of the bytes in our path and we're going to set them to zero, and we're going to do that for all 64 bytes. That just clears out the string for us. Then we can do our same string cat process of path, well, yeah, path to profile path, and then we're going to string cat path and username, uh, not all caps, 
And then we will string cat path with, whoops, dot der. Okay. Now remember, dot pem is the human readable format, whereas dot der is a raw binary format. So why would I want both formats here? Well, our private key, this one, is really just used for login purposes. And well, actually we'll be using it for some uh, cryptographic purposes in the future, but really what we're after at this point is this ability to log in. So in order to be able to use a password here, we have to save it in a PEM format. Okay, so that's what leads us to make this decision. But the public key, how are we going to use the public key? Well, really we're going to be sharing that and we want to share that in the most concise format possible which is this raw binary so the der so we're also going to uh, excuse me we're going to extract our public key in the raw binary format rather than the human readable pem that way it's easy for us to transfer it okay so we are going to once again open our key file so We should also close it, shouldn't we? Okay, key file equal f open path write mode. And now we want to use this function. So i2d. So i2d is where we are taking a Basically, we're taking a key and we are going to, well, we're taking one of these P keys, one of the internal OpenSSL library keys, and we are converting it to this raw binary format. Uh, the opposite exists as well. If we have the raw binary, binary format, we can convert it to uh, I, whatever I stands for. And so there's D2I also, for example. But what we're going to do is try and take our I2D function and put our public key into a new file. And what's interesting is we can actually use the same key that we defined up here. Is that correct? Yes. So we can use the same key up here. Now, would I want to actually just save? No, 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 no. We're going we're gonna to stick with the DER format here. Okay. So, I2D, pub key, FP, file pointer. Okay, so where are we going to save it and what are we going to save? We are going to save to key file. And we are going to save key. It's as simple as that, really. But I'm also going to do another error check here. So if not this... If that does not work, we're going to do the same thing. Print to standard error. Okay. And I don't like that these are capitalized. Those are not proper nouns. Grammar is important, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. <laughs> okay, and then we can return exit failure. Okay. And then after that, we close the file. And we free the context. So EVPP key. And we actually would need to do that in a couple of additional places as well. Because if things fail here, it's, it would be good practice to go ahead and close and especially free things along the way. If you aren't familiar with the concept of freeing, what this means essentially is that when I created my new EVP context up here, it allocated space on the heap for it. And heap is 
uh, manual memory management. So I have to, since I manually allocated it, I have to manually deallocate it. Hello, this decubuter. <laughs> Sorry about that. Cabooter. <laughs> Welcome. Glad you're here. Anyway, so yes, this allocated space on the heap, and so I need to free it. And if I only free it down here, then if there's an error here, even though we are basically telling it to quit and it would uh, deallocate anyway, it was, it's a good practice just to make sure that it goes ahead and closes the file and frees that allocated memory. So this essentially sums up our create account function. And once again, I am noticing how long this is taking in comparison to the rest of what we have to do. So <laughs> we might not actually finish all of this today, which is unfortunate, but so be it. We can, we can pick up where we left off. All right, so we are good to go with the account create. And what we want to do now is return exit success. Again, I'm using the uh, the kind of macro definition, exit failure, exit success. That way, whoever is using this later can uh, define that to be however they like. OK, now, OK, so this is our way of creating an account. So what we've created an account. and now that we have an account, what are we going to want to do with the account? Well, most likely we're going to want to create a block. So let's come back to our block and create a function for creating a block. And I'm going to make a little bit of a prediction here and suspect that I'm going to do the same thing where I return an integer. And we'll give it our prefix. And I'm going to call it create block. And what are we going to need to pass into this in order to create a block? Well, we're just going to need the data. So we're going to pass in a byte pointer to data. Now, we don't know how big data is yet, so we're also going to pass in an unsigned long to represent the size in bytes of our data. This way we can give it whatever data we want. This can be a JPEG image, this could be a YouTube live stream, this could be the source code for a blockchain. We can put whatever we want in data. We just need to specify how big it is, okay? So once we do that, we should be good to go. Okay, so let's copy this over here. And where is this going to go? So here's the interesting thing. I'm thinking of these two files the way that I would approach an essay. So like, the, the layout of where these things happen is important to me. So um, I've defined the create block function up here. You know, I'm going to worry about that more later. For now, we're going to, it might get a little messy. We're going to do them in order. Okay. Okay, so the first thing we're going to want to do is allocate space on the heap for our new block. And this needs to be the this needs to be big enough to store both the headers of the block and the data of the block. So what we're going to do is create a new one. So blockchain object block pointer block equals malloc. And we're going to allocate on the heap how much size? We're going to take the size of the block headers plus size. So this gives us the size, however much size we need for the headers, and however much size we need for the data. Notice that I did not take the size of our object block. That's because our block object has one additional field, one byte for data. And really what we're doing here is allocating an arbitrary size for our block. And then when I reference the field data, that is going to be the first byte after the headers. And so we can use that memory address to reference the rest of the data, however big it is, in our block. Okay, so we allocate the size of the headers plus the size of the data rather than the size of a block, which would look like a size data one. Anyway, okay, so we've allocated our space here, and now we want to fill in some of the header fields. So block headers dot we don't have any fields yet so let's start filling in our fields our first field is going to be who authored it 
So we, this is going to be the public key for whoever is authoring it. Okay, and what we need to do is look at one of these in a DER format. So I'm going to do this this way. So I'm going to do open, what, what I'm doing here, okay, open SSL. Open SSL is what I am using here to uh, generate these keys, but actually in C, we would call this lib crypto. Open SSL is a command line tool. And I'm going to use that command line tool here to generate a DER format of my private key here. And actually, I can just delete my public key. I don't need that. So <laughs> open SSL, RSA in eric.pm-out.der-out-form is going to be der. And, and what is this about? We need to capitalize that. I don't know. There you can see my password prompt. So you're not going to see my password, but <laughs> you can see that it's prompting me for a password. And this is exactly what it will look like uh, within the application itself. So it's kind of cool. Here we go. We have generated a new DER key and the reason I did that was so that I can get info and show you that it is exactly 550 bytes so I can in my block headers somewhere I can define a byte structure called author of 550 bytes and we can embed the public key directly in there okay now <laughs> here's the trick in order to actually do that, we have to have an account. Okay, so Dick Kabooter says, so I recently made a small simple blockchain, but now I kind of want to make a website to use the blockchain and make transactions. So people can make an account and make transactions. How would I do that? Do I need to store every block inside a database? Can you give me some advice? Yeah, so it sounds like what you're describing is a central server and that is actually kind of what I am going for here. So uh, let me tell you how I would design an application on this blockchain and maybe that can help you think about how you would design it for uh, whatever specifics are related to the blockchain you're using. So in mine, I've designed these blocks to store anything. So if we look here, I have my object of a block, which has the byte of data. But as we just saw here, I allocate an arbitrary amount of space for our data. And so long as our headers are the same, I can put whatever I want in the data. And that could be transactions, that could be uh, content about a website, it could be the web page itself. Anything I want can go in that block. Now, in order for this to be a blockchain, those blocks need to be distributed across the network. So everybody needs to be able to have the block okay now where this comes into play for an application let's say i wanted to make twitter but i wanted to make it on a blockchain so the client would essentially be calling this function where they create a block and the data they pass in would be the 255 characters that consist of their tweet and the size would be the number of characters within that tweet we would do this whole function to create the block and then that would be distributed out to the network. So every node on the network would have a copy of it. Then your central server would be somewhere where like a client application could go and say, hey, show me all of the blocks that are related to the tweet with this hash. And so it goes through and it finds all of the blocks that are related to that and it will give those to you. So that's kind of how you can implement a client server application on top of a blockchain. Does that kind of make sense to you? Uh, let me know in the chat. I think there's a bit of a delay. So we've created this block or we've allocated space for its size, but we need to have our user logged in first. So we need a account login function. And this is going to be related to this. You can see why I'm jumping back and forth a bit now because they are very directly related. So let's create an account login function. So 
here. Probably going to be very similar. And I want to change a naming convention. So I have create account here and then account login. This would be much better if I did account create and block create. That way all of the functions related to an account will have blockchain account and then a further descriptive suffix. Okay. And are we going to pass anything to this? Uh, maybe a username? I don't know. Maybe we we'll prompt that within the login thing that we do here. So here in my original version of the project, Oh, anyway, uh, so yeah, I want to make a small demo cryptocurrency, but I guess you need to store every block inside a database in order to make wallets and get the blockchain info, right? So, uh, kind of. A blockchain already is a database, so storing blocks in a database would be a bit redundant. Um, what you're thinking of is indexing the blockchain. Uh, also, I guess you need miners to mine complete the block. So, okay. Two things going on here. Um, first of all, the blockchain is a database. It's it's already a database. So to store blocks in a database would be a redundant step. That being said, what we'll see here as I go into this project a little more is that I do actually have a database where I am logging not the blocks, but the block headers. And this essentially indexes the blockchain. I did not want to open that file. Um, so. I will create a database that will contain all of the information of block headers. So every node will have a list of all the block headers they've ever seen. And this will allow us to really easily be able to find specific blocks on the blockchain. Now, the blockchain as a database is trying to store this, with the headers being a way of finding and validating data within the blockchain. So. The, so the SQLite database I'm using is a basically just an indexing tool for that bigger database. As for miners, uh, you can conceptualize miners in a few different ways. So traditionally speaking, you would have uh, everybody would contribute their transactions to this pool, this one central pool, and then the dedicated miners will come and they were going to try and mine all of those transactions together in one big block, claiming all of the reward for themselves. My blockchain works a little bit different. So again, going back to my Twitter example, the person who is calling this, uh, where is it? My block create function, it's the person authoring the tweet and they're passing in their tweet to this data. and mining this block is going to be done by the person who wrote the tweet. Okay, so whoever creates the content is going to also create the block storing the content, thus claiming the rewards for having created that block for themselves. I want my blockchain to reward content creators. Okay, so the idea here is that to contribute something to the blockchain, the price of entry is mining. So you mine the block for whatever data you want, then it's on the blockchain and any of the rewards that come as a result of having mined that go to whoever created it. So yeah, there are different ways that you can conceptualize miners in this. Um, so think outside the box with that. You might have a different idea. Anyway, we need to log in and I need to drink some water. So every block has one message. Um, not necessarily. Like I said, my blockchain is for anything. Um, in, the, in an example where, let's say, I build a Twitter application on top of this, then yes, one model for doing that would be to have one message per block. And as you'll see later, I actually tie the difficulty of mining and the value 
to the size of a block. So yeah, one block would contain one tweet and it would be a very small, easy to mine and low value block. Uh, whereas I could also put a YouTube video, like an hour long YouTube video in a block. That would be a much bigger block, much more difficult to mine and much more valuable. Anyway, so we need our login function here. And here what we're going to do is essentially find these two files again and load them into our account structure that we defined here. So our public and private key. And what we're going to do is, did I have it copied already? I need to change the names here. Okay, so let's log in. What we're going to do is look for this same path that we did up here. So we can actually copy this code right here. Okay, and now we can do file, e file, def open, path in read mode. And if not e file, so if it doesn't find the key file, print def, standard error. Uh, this is the private key count. Okay. Uh, we need to close it. We're going to exit failure. Otherwise, we are going to actually load it. And okay. Uh, so let's say I want to get all the info for one user to get the wallet. How do I get all of the info for the block? So how do you get all the transactions to make the wallet from the previous block? Okay, so you got a couple questions going on there. Um, so let's see. How do I get all the info for the blocks? Uh, well... In mine, for instance, it's just saved in a block file. So this file is your block, okay? Um, if you open this block and look at the raw binary data, it's the headers are there and the block data is there. So how you get the information of this is you, you just read it. And that's sort of the benefit of using what I've been describing as concrete objects. So with a concrete object, you can save it literally to a file like this, and then you can open it again in a struct like this. And since those byte objects line up exactly, like the first 550 bytes will be the author, um, you can just load that straight in. So as far as getting that information goes, if you use a concrete object like this, that's really easy. Um, if you use something like a Python object, you're going to have more work to do there. And uh, that's a topic for another time. Um, how do you get all the transactions to make the wallet from the previous block? So what you're talking about there sounds like the Bitcoin model where one block contains a lot of different transactions. Really, you would just do the same thing. Load in your block into the defined structure. And then in my case, the data here would be a list of different transactions. And then you could just iterate over that list in whatever format that it has to extract all of the... Are you quizzing me? <laughs> I, I'm, you, you, suddenly I'm suspicious that you, you know the answer to this and are quizzing me. Anyway, I guess you need to some kind of database server to store the block file. Here. No, no, no. So... Uh, Again, the blockchain is itself a database. It's already a database. Um, in my case, uh, where you're, you're jumping the gun here a little bit. I do create a client and a server. So first of all, let me just go ahead and uh, spoil the surprise that a peer-to-peer -peer network is just one in which 
uh, nodes are acting as clients and servers uh, depending on the situation so there's really not a distinction to be made there and the distinction between cli client and servers are honestly kind of fuzzy as well so we're just going to talk about nodes anyway um uh, the way it works is you have basically a web server and this web server is going to listen for connections to other nodes on the blockchain network and then they are going to exchange blocks so I mean, if you want it in the previous block, you just need to find the most recent block and then look at what's in it. Um, you don't really need anything beyond that, except, again, just keeping in mind that I am embedding my SQLite database in here, and the purpose of this is so that I can index the blockchain. Um, one additional nuance here is that on typical blockchains, the previous block is singular. Everyone knows what the previous block is going to be, Whereas mine, any block can reference any other block as its previous block. So, uh, like the previous block isn't a relevant concept on my particular blockchain, um, and and that's why I decided to embed SQLite into this because I want to be able to index my headers, and I will be able to search for them using a SQLite database by headers as opposed to here where I just have this raw binary file, if that makes sense. So you, you don't need a database server for anything. You don't need it, but it makes it a lot easier to find things later. If I want all of the blocks authored by person X, well, I would want something that has indexed those headers. If I want all the blocks that contain um, data of type X, then it's that's where you would have a, a database to sort of tell you information about the blockchain it's not it's not part of the blockchain itself it's more tangential okay all right so let's see okay we open our our key and we load it all right um yeah but i mean how do you get the previous block when it isn't stored how can someone code be stored no, i'm not quizzing you <laughs> Okay, so you get the previous block when it isn't stored. Um, well, this is something that's sort of handled automatically by the network. And again, this, there's, I'm, a, I'm not sure how to describe this, whether it's in the context of blockchains in general or my specific blockchain, because mine handles this in a unique way. Um, in mine, the concept of the previous block is not super important. Um, you can make your previous block. The, the only requirement is that it exists on the chain. So it just has to have already existed before yours. It can be the origin block. It can be the, the first one created after the origin block. It can have 80 other people referencing it as their previous block. So... Um, the previous block isn't a thing on mine. Uh, for my Twitter example, let me say, uh, let's say this. Let's say you're replying to a tweet. Your previous block would be the block that contains the tweet you're replying to. Or in the case of a YouTube video, uh, where the original block is the video, the block containing your comment, its previous block will be the video on which it is commenting. So previous block means something different in the context of my project here in your project you're talking about like how do you get the most up-to-date block in a linear blockchain where there is only one next block it's a it's it's yeah you, you know the traditional format and really that's handled through this uh these networking functions so server server.c so here i am defining a protocol by which nodes clients and servers connect and what they do when they connect and what you would do essentially here is have it so that when one node creates a block it would just send it to some server that it is connected to in the past and you would want to program in some cascading effect into this protocol where assuming the server says yes this is a valid block uh, then it would send it on, say, to two additional servers. 
and then those two would send it on to two and those two would send it on to two and essentially it would just sort of cascade through the network and in your traditional blockchains where there only is one previous block um, this is kind of handled naturally because whoever generates it first has the longest chain following it because more people have built off of it so um, it doesn't matter if like there are two additional ones it's the stuff with the previous block is uh, it's it's an important blockchain concept so i don't want to gloss over it but in the context of my project it's not relevant so it's it's i'm afraid of confusing people by going too deeply into it let's say in total 100 blocks have been made crypto so when we are at block 100 how do i get the info from block one without there being a database i guess you can get the block out of air okay so um, you're going to be storing the blocks as files on your machine so like every node it's it's that's not necessarily true so on most like the bitcoin blockchain for instance most nodes are only storing the headers okay so you have a physical file of the headers on your blockchain node and um more industrial bitcoin servers will have the full block okay so it's stored on your machine and you store either a copy of the headers or the full block on your node. So uh, it should just be updated automatically. It's, it's not something you really have to do. If that makes sense. And the, the, the storing of those physical files is itself the database. So it's, it's, you don't need an additional database for your blockchain. I happen to be using one, but it's, you don't need an additional one for it like if you have a um a sql database and a no sql database okay you don't need a sql database to run a no sql database nor do you need a no sql database to run a sql database but there are circumstances where you might run the two in concert if you need certain features from each so if you need the document features from mongodb but you also need the relational features and joining abilities of SQL, you might maintain two databases of the same information to get different benefits from the way you're storing it. And that's what I'm doing here, but you don't need either. You, you, can, you can get it. There you go. We got it. Cool. Okay. Wow. It's almost noon. <laughs> we are not even, we're not even getting onto the server stuff yet. We haven't even, we've done like nothing over here. Okay, so uh, we're logging in, we're logging in. Okay, so we've confirmed that this file exists. So now that we've confirmed that it exists, where do we want to go? Here. Okay, I'm using D2I pubkey FP, and the D2I is uh, exactly the opposite of the I2D that we used up here, right here, where we created the file originally. So we're essentially just going to reverse that process over here. And what I want to do is here, say D2I. See, this is where they've actually left off their naming conventions. This should say like OpenSSL or something like that. But anyway, um, and first we're going to use the private key, but can we use that? Okay, we have to use. Okay, okay. So I'm, I'm missing a variable here too. So with the account login, I actually want to pass it a account object that is to store this login information. So account, and we want the we want this to be a pointer that we would want to copy everything over every time we call this function. So passing the memory address of something allows us to access this variable directly and manipulate it. And we also don't have to make a copy of it. If we did it without the pointer, 
uh, it would make a local copy of that variable here. Any changes we made to it would only take effect in this local scope. And yeah, it just takes more memory, et cetera, et cetera. So pointers, battle of pointers. So we pass it that and then the character pointer for their username. Go. Okay. And e2i pub key fp. We're going to open the file and we're going to store it in count private key or sorry, public key there. Okay. So what this does is it we give it a account object and this will allow us to uh, make use of this login account anywhere. We don't have to have any sort of like global user account. It's just whenever you're about to do something that requires a user account, you can just create an account object, call this function, pass it that account and do whatever you need to do. So it'll be a lot easier. Okay, so we have our login and conflicting types now, of course. So let's fix that. No, don't open the SQLite file. Never open. Minimize. Okay. Where is it? Cool. Okay. That should be good. Now. So we load the file that has our public key into the accounts public key field. That way we can store the public key and the private key together. And do I do some error checking here? I don't. Should I? Returns. So that's something that's a bit awkward. So like in this circumstance, it returns of uh, one or zero, I think, or maybe negative numbers. And here it actually returns the key. But actually, I think we can do the same. Let's just do it. If, not, if that returns null, then that's an error. So we're going to f print f standard error. Close it. Okay, so that should load in our public key. And now we want to deal with the private key. So first we need to clear out the path once again. So we'll do that with our mem set. We're going to do that to path. We're going to set everything to zero and we're going to do that for 64 bytes. And then we have our string cat process where we are going to put into path profile path defined as a global variable. And we're going to put in the username and then finally, we are going to put in string cat path dot der. And that's going to give us our public key or, uh oh, I did this backwards. This is going to be the private key. Okay, and here we need to use the PEM read private key. And we also need to set that. Do Yeah, so, okay, so I need to initialize the, the user account. So let's, let's do that. Let's do that right here up top. Okay, so that initializes it. Again, allocating space for it. We need to remember to free these, which is important. Let's put a little note here. This is the danger of calling malloc in a function is you have to remember to free it. And if you don't free it at the end of the function, you run the danger of never freeing it. So recall, <laughs> okay. So we've done that. We can now load things into those. So what's our function? PEM read private key. key. And 
So here's something that is also peculiar. I set it equal to that here, and I also pass it in there, and I'm not sure which one actually works. I think passing it in, and we should do an error checking. So our path, oh, not that. We need to open the key file. So close that there, open it here. Again, do the same error check. Make sure that that file exists. This is the... Hold on, hold on. Yeah, okay. Okay, so we check if it exists. Going to load private. And then otherwise, we are going to get file. Okay, sorry. And then the address of count a, a private key. Password callback. We're not going to do that because that's going to uh, be handled by default because we're using these PEMs. So that is something we don't have to worry about. Again, this is a function that would be called whenever it asks for a password. And the second parameter, this void u, would be passed into this callback function for the actual execution of it, but we don't need that since we've used that encryption methods that we have. We can pass in null for both of those. So that should read our private key, but we want to double check to make sure that actually happened. So if not that, we are going to print f standard error. And actually, I should also do, I should also free them. So, well, I could free them individually or I could free them together. Mm. So what I'm wondering here is that we've created an account and where is it? Uh, up here we have called these and these allocate space. So we need to make sure these are freed. And since we created them, in, yeah, I think it makes sense to actually free them in here as well. So we're going to do count. Private key because nobody would remember not. See, really, this is the benefit of, um, as you can see, I've done this project already. I mean, I'm copying my own code here, but you can see that even though I'm almost word for word copying everything I've already done it's really still a thoughtful process where I am revising things. And that's really the key here is an iterative process towards perfection and making it better and better and better each time. So um, I am making this project for uh, an additional time. I will probably do this exercise again in the future, each time just trying to make it a little bit better. So. Anyway, you can see that even now I'm coming up with new things that should be done. But anyway, this essentially is going to give us our login and assuming all of that has worked well, then we should be able to um, see. 
I also want to put in regular messages. So instead of just printing out error messages, let's print out some success messages as well. So And we should have something similar for the other one. Okay, so we check for the file and make sure that it exists. And then we try to load the file into a key. And assuming it works, we get a happy little message. And then we do the same thing for the other key because remember there are two keys here. We save both of these into the account object that is created externally to the function, uh, but has the fields allocated within the function. Therefore, we free those fields here when we exit with failures, but we also need to do here. That's why I speak through everything when I do it like this. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, no more, no more memory leaks, we're good. Okay, so that should do it for that. Okay, so if, well, we want to log in. So our object account will create this new account object. And then what we're going to do is log in. And we're going to pass it the address of our new account. And let's give it, some username, but we don't know what the username is yet. So where are we going to prompt them for this? Here again, we are thinking of, aha, you know what? Thinking of interfaces, uh, I don't want to put any login features making like prompts show up in this block create function, which be maybe called from who knows what kind of context. So really what I want to do is actually pass in the account itself to this function. So uh, the login will be handled by whatever interface I'm using. So that's not something I need to worry about within this function. I will pass the account in manually. But at least we now have our login function. We need that there. And Okay, so jumping back to our block, what is it not like? Same. All right. <laughs> anyway, so we have allocated what? What? I don't think they are conflicting Xcode. I'm pretty confident that they're not. All right. Well, we're going to ignore that and hopefully it will fix itself in the future. So we've allocated our block. So now we need to actually start implementing some of those fields. And as we saw, the first field that we have is the author. Who created this block? Well, we're going to say that the author, so block, well, we can't just do this directly. We, we need to copy byte by byte uh, the contents of our account's public key, those 550 bytes in this file. We need to copy those contents into our block into our header fields. So m copy, which comes from the string library. We're going to put this in, let's see, block headers dot author. So that's going to give us the address of or a pointer to the first byte in this array. And the source of this is actually going to be actually no, that's not what we want to Okay, memcopy is not the function because that would assume that we have the key in its 550 byte form somewhere. But really what we have is an EVPP key. 
we have this abstract data type uh, created by OpenSSL from which we can extract those 550 bytes. So really what we want to do is back to the same function that we called in our account create rather than public key here, rather than sending this to a file pointer, we want to send it somewhere else. And let's see, where do I do that over here? Not reinvent the wheel, shall we? Where do I do that? Fine. There it is. Okay. So what we're going to do is our I2D hub key, and we're going to take the account that they passed us with the public key that is defined there, and we're going to put it in our block headers dot author. And since I know the output of that is 550 bytes, and I know that I allocated 550 bytes is um, basically what I'm saying is I know I've allocated enough space here. And now I'm getting this little warning that I'm passing a byte pointer of 550 to an unsigned character pointer pointer. Uh, remember that I type def unsigned character to be byte, so that is actually the same. And what this is saying is that I am passing a pointer to an array where it's expecting a pointer to a pointer. Now that really means the same thing, but it's, it's just letting me know that there is um, some kind of loss of precision there. So I can solve this really easily by just changing this to unsigned character pointer pointer, and that will turn off the error message. Now, why bother doing that? Um, mainly because it's good practice. It's, it's, if you compile your code and it's printing out error messages and there's something simple you can do like putting in this, uh, this explicit casting to turn off the error message, do it. It just makes your code look better, okay? So yeah, that's how we do that. I'm ignoring this one for now because it's wrong, okay? It's, it's the, the signatures match, I promise. Okay, so we have now saved the public key of whoever is creating this block into the block itself, okay? Now what we want to do is copy the data into that block, and here's where we're going to use memcopy. And you'll also see why I have defined my block structure the way I did with this single field for data. So we're going to say memcopy, and our destination is going to be the address of block data. Remember, the data is just a single byte. It's a single unsigned character. But since we're taking the address of it, we are using this memory address to refer to everything that we allocated here after the block headers. And this is how we can create a block of an arbitrary size. So our data goes there. Our source is going to be the actual data that the user sent us. And the size is just going to be exactly the size that they passed in, the size of our data. So that's pretty easy. And we also might want a header field to tell us the size of this object. So unsigned long size. And an unsigned long, if I am not mistaken, is eight bytes. Where? There it is. Unsigned long, eight bytes. Okay, so our entire block structure by default has 559 bytes. And it's that consistency of size that makes this a much more robust blockchain than what you would get in, say, Python, for example. So in Python, I couldn't tell you what the layout of the bytes were in my block. I couldn't tell you what this looked like in memory. Therefore, the hash of this block would be the result of me telling you what the hash is, rather than it being implicit to the object itself. So let's take a look at 
this example block here. I created this with uh, the old version of the project that you can see on GitHub right here. This is kind of a prototype origin block. You can see it has a really long name, but what's important about it is since it is a concrete object, I can, well, let's ls so I can actually copy and paste that name. If I do the SHA sum with the um, 512 algorithm on that file, you'll see that its hash is literally the hash of the block. So it's not that I have a property called hash into which I have put this value, it's that the literal hash of my block is this value, and that is the power of a concrete object. It has these organic properties that um, is, makes it much more robust. Anyway, so where were we? Doesn't know that. Oh, okay, I defined that up here, so. I'm going to need to come through this later and uh, structure the layout of this code. This is kind of messy, and I want it to be way cleaner than this. So that's going to have to be off camera. Anyway, can we get that to go away, please? Anyway, OK, so let's put a size field in there. We've got it in the header. So now we can just say block headers.size equals size. And that's easy enough to do. OK, now. What we're also going to want is every block is going to need to reference a previous block. So we're going to need a field in our block headers to capture that. And the most concise way to store it, well, if we look at the hash here, uh, this is a hexadecimal number. And this hexadecimal number represents the digest of our block. So we want the most concise possible way to store this. I didn't mean to copy that. Well, let's just, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, we want the most concise possible way to store that. And the way to do that is in uh, binary, raw bytes, and the size of that particular output is going to be 64. So we're going to have a previous block. So we're going to give it a byte previous. 64, and that's where we're going to put our previous hash, which means that in our create block function, we're also going to need to pass another block object because we need a block to reference as our previous block. So, where. Is. We need to pass. Previous, okay, which means I'm going to get that sad me message again. Put that there. Okay, so now what we can do is say that the hash of our of the block we're creating is going to be the the previous black. Uh, excuse me, the previous block of the one we are creating is the hash of this block, but that's going to require a hashing function. OK. This was a much bigger project than I expected it to be. So let me think. Um, I'm going to take a five minute break here, and I'll be back shortly. I'm just going to grab some water, and let me think of a smooth way for us to land this project. I fortunately don't think we're going to be able to actually get the whole thing but we'll see we'll see what happens let me let me take a five minute break here i'll be right back
All right. I bumped the mic there, so sorry if you got a loud noise. Settle in, and I think our battery is good enough for the face cam again. Yeah, let's bring that bad boy. All right. They should be activated. Hooray. Okay. So, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how far we're going to get here. Um, this is quite the project so we're just going to go as far as we can and we'll see what happens okay let's keep going so we're going to need a hashing function in order to get the previous hash um in order to get the hash originally but we can leave that alone for now and just do a mem copy here so mem copy uh, the destination is going to be the block headers dot previous and the source is going to be oh this is where we need the actual hash of the block so we're going to need to actually hash the block in here so I had a comment that we need to do this later so but essentially what we're going to end up with is a a array of 64 bytes that is going to be our digest for now we're just going to set it equal to zero for simplicity but later we're going to call a function that will actually hash the block remember when i showed you that the hash of the physical block is literally the hash of the block so rather than storing the hash of the block as a field i'm going to have to actually calculate it every time i want it and the reason we can't store it as a field is because storing it as a field would change the hash of the block so we can't and so every time we want to reference the hash we're going to need to generate it um, which is a little bit annoying, but we'll create a function for it, so it'll be easy. We're going to do that in a bit. So, for now, we are just going to copy our from our source as digest. We're just going to copy all 64 bytes into our previous hash field. Okay? And then, we're going to need... Well, let's see author the size of the block previous block i want to put in here a digital signature so a byte so along with an rsa key one of the things we can do is encryption so i can encrypt this file i can take the contents of it put it through my private key encrypt it make it so nobody else can read it and then send it to you and you can decrypt it with my public key or vice versa, which is kind of the more useful version, where you encrypt it with my public key, and then I can read it with my private key. Okay, another thing that we can do is create what's called a digital signature, which validates my authorship of this file. So it can say that whoever created the signature also possessed the private key. So let me demonstrate this very quickly for you. So I'm going to do an ls here, and I'm going to do open SSL dgst uh is that correct um e i believe is eric.pm dash sign i want to sign i'm forgetting the format of this 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 command line argument let me google it um Come on. Okay. Okay, so first we specify the algorithm we want to use. I want to use SHA-512. And I want to sign using eric.pem. Which document do I want to sign? Well, I'll make the output will be and then I want for the last argument uh, pi and 
assign it. And now what you'll see is I have this signature SHA-512, and what I can do is say open SSL uh, DGST. And again, I need to check the format of this. Verify, yeah. SHA-512 dash verify Eric dot DER. So now I'm using the DER, the public key. So I signed it using my private key. And now what we're trying to do is validate my authorship of this abstract.py file using my signature and public key. So I need to um, specify key form is DER because I'm using that raw binary format. So we specify that and anything else I need. Ah, that's right. Dash signature. And then it's on web. Is that right? Verified okay. So what this has shown me is that the signature for, I created th this signature here along with this file using my private key. And then when I send these things to you, you can use the public key and the signature to validate that whoever authored this file, or at least authored this signature, uh, was in possession of both th this file and this private key. So that's how we're going to validate authorship. And what I want to do is essentially embed this signature directly into our blocks. That way we are sort of uh, locking into place the authorship of the block. So how big is this? It is 512 bytes. So we can actually directly put our signature of 512 bytes into our block headers. And then we're going to want to actually digitally sign it. So we're going to want to generate the signature. Okay. And then finally, I think finally, um, let me, is that finally? It might be finally. We'll find out. So uh, next, I want to add our unsigned long of a nunce. And our nunce is basically a number only used once. And what this is going to be doing is essentially, this is how we are going to be doing our proof of work algorithm. And how we are going to mine the blockchain is by manipulating this field. So we're just going to set it equal to zero at the start. So block headers.nunce equals zero. Okay, we're gonna set it to zero, and then we are actually going to, we're gonna mine the block using our proof of work function, and we'll talk about that shortly. We're going to have to design a proof of work that makes sense within the context of our particular blockchain, and I need some water. <laughs> now that we have the camera, this is much more awkward. So there we go, we got, we're on, we're on that kind of a basis now. I guess you can call me Eric. <laughs> anyway, so, okay. Um, what are we going to do? So first we are going to copy in, well, we allocate space for the block. Then we copy the author's key in there. And we set the size and we copy the data. Then we copy the previous hash. We generate a signature and copy the signature in. We'll do that in a moment. Um, or should we do that? How did I do it in this one? I had a separate function for signing the block. Okay, we'll do that. We'll do it the same way. So we're going to generate and embed the signature into the block. And then we're going to mine the block, and that's where we are incrementing the nunts and checking the hash. So, I'm sorry, just, just give me one moment here. Okay, first of all, uh, one mistake I made, so the block header's size is not the size of the data, it's the size of the entire block. So it has to be size of our block headers. 
plus the size of the data. Okay, uh, but that wasn't really what I was asking. Looking for this. So first we signed it, then we mine it, then we just validate it again to make sure, and then we save it. Okay, so that's simple enough. We copy in all of the things here, and I'm probably going to separate these out into functions. I think what the thing to do now is, is to create the proof of work function. So what I'm going to do is over here to find a new function, where will it go? It'll be here. So this one will we'll also have it return in blockchain. Lock proof of work. Maybe this should be a Boolean. And we're going to need to include bool for that. What's the Boolean library called again? Uh, standard bool, isn't it? Is that not included in Mac OS? Let's see that. Is it a prototype function you were defining? Yeah, I'm defining a prototype right now, but it's... Um, let's do that and see what happens there. Um, yeah, I'm defining a prototype function, but I want it. This is basically our proof of work algorithm. So this is how we're going to confirm that a block has met the difficulty requirement. Okay. So our proof of work, we're going to pass it a block and it's going to just test whether that difficulty has been met. And in order to do this, we're going to need to be able to hash a block first. So. This is going to be void, and we're going to say blockchain block hash. We're going to pass this a block pointer to the block and a byte pointer to a digest for output. Okay, so we're going to have our output stored here. Okay, so let's copy these two in here. And I'm going to need to put them above create. So let's start with hash because that's necessary for proof of work. So in order to hash, we're going to need some open SSL function. So let's take a look over here and so here's where it's, it's a pretty simple, but you need to know how EVP structures work, these envelope structures from OpenSSL. So the first thing we're going to want to do is to create our context or our CTX. And we do this with EVP CTX new. So EVP, uh, did I use MD CTX? Yes, MD CTX pointer CTX equals EVP MD CTX new. Easy. <laughs> and now we're going to initialize, update, and arrive at a final state in that context with the specifics being our block. So what we're going to want is to initialize it. So EPP it, what did I call that? Digest in it. We're going to initialize this digest with the CTX we just created. And the type we want to use is SHA-512. So you can use whatever cryptographic hashing algorithm you like. Uh, SHA-256 is the one that's used on Bitcoin blockchain and I think Ethereum. I'm not really sure which one they use, but I'm going for SHA-512. It's supposed to be a little bit more secure than 256. I've heard uh, mumblings about possible collisions in SHA-256 and possible problems in the future. So in order to avoid all of that, I'm just going to go ahead and jump the gun and move to SHA-512. So we'll do EVP SHA-512, EVP SHA-512. And that's going to be the algorithm we use for hashing. And we then pass it. No, oh, what am I missing here? EX. And so we need one last. And that's probably the engine parameter, which we're not 
we're not dealing with engines, so we don't need to worry about that. And we want to do a little error check here. So if that is less than or equal to zero, we want to have an error. So uh, standard bool dot eight made a mistake in the code. You wrote digest. You wrote digest instead. Oh, thank you. Okay, so our, what, what are we gonna print? Uh, blockchain error. And then we want to free the context, EVP, MD, CTX, Free. We'll free the context, and then we will return. Uh oh. Well, I guess if we're not returning anything, we can. We should return something. Maybe int as usual here. We can always return int. Int is always good. That way we can continue returning exit failure and it will give the uh, end user, whoever is implementing this API, the option to sort of cascade that out. And if they want to handle that, they can easily handle exit failure. And if they want to quit, they can easily quit and just kind of pass that along. So I think it's better that we pass an exit code out rather than actually exiting. That way we um, don't step on anyone else's toes, okay? So that is going to initialize it, and then we need to update it. So it'll be basically the same process. So EVP digest update. We're going to update our context with the data being our block, and our size is going to be block headers dot size. And that's why, well, part of the reason why I wanted my uh, block to contain the size of the, the data plus the headers, not just the size of the data, is that oftentimes when I'm referencing the size of the block, I want the entire size of the block. Plus, since the headers are a constant size, it's pretty easy to go back and forth. So anyway, we're going to update the that data with that size. And if that is less than or equal to zero, we'll do the same thing. And then finally, if EVP digest final, this is where we arrive at the final state of context and um, what do I pass where? Digest and size. Where does size come? Oh. So this is something that uh, it's, it's more for when you don't know the final size of your output. So here I can put my, uh, this byte here, digest, and it will save the final hex digest or the, uh, the, not hex digest, but the final digest of the hash into that byte array. And it will also tell me the size of that byte array here. Uh, but I don't really need it to. So I can give it the address of size. I, I know it's going to be 64 because it's call it 512. That's, it's going to be 64. It's, that's, that's how it works. So anyway, if that is less than or equal to zero, do they all this? Yeah, we'll do exactly the same thing. Great. And then otherwise, we just will EVP MD CTX free we'll free the context and then we will return exit success hooray okay so that is how we are going to hash a block so um, down here for example let's let's show how that works we will get the previous hash okay so here delete this comment because we're going to take care of that We've set a, a byte array of 64 bytes for to store our digest. 
And now what we want to do is actually call this hashing function so that we can get that digest. So what we'll do is say block hash. We're going to pass it the previous and our digest. And uh, spell that wrong. And now, when uh, after this function is executed, it will uh, it will fill this digest with uh, this block's hash, and then we will copy that block's hash into the previous field. So that's how we're going to actually be using this. And see, is there a bit cleaner way to do this? No, I think that's pretty good. Unless, wow, check this out. Ho, 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 look at me. Okay. Check that out. <laughs> We're just going to pass the header field directly in to argument. That way it will create the hash and just store it directly into our block. We don't need to do anything. That's going to be... Much easier. That's some clean code right there. That's the sort of stuff that I like. Anyway, uh, what was I going to do here? So if that does not equal... That doesn't equal exit success. F... Now, this is almost certainly a redundant error message. So, if we think about it, if, if this hash function fails, it failed because it hit one of these, which means that it printed out one of these error messages. So, printing out another one is a bit redundant, but... I think it's going to be a little bit more thorough that we go ahead and do that. So I would rather get two messages that say hey, it failed to hash a block and specifically it failed to initialize the EVP context. Uh, well, it didn't do that every time, did it? We need to <laughs> change what it actually did. Failed to update, failed to finalize. Yes, okay, so I would rather get two error messages than not enough. So. Make your choices there. And what should we do here? We should free the block and return exit failure. Okay. That's how we get that hash. And now let's talk about our proof of work. So our proof of work is essentially going to return true if our uh, block in its current state passes the proof of work test, and it will return false if it does not. So what we're going to want to do is to calculate our difficulty. So how do I want to approach this? So we're going to enter this through an infinite, well, not an infinite loop, but while... Um, well, we do a do while because we always want to do it once. Yeah, we pretty much always want to do it once. Let's, let's start with a do while. You know how often those are used. <laughs> so we're going to do this while not proof of work on block. So this is just going to be a loop that's going to increment our nonce until um, until we have successfully met our proof of work requirement. And I don't think I want to do this as a do while. So do it a little bit different. While not. Oops.
That's how I want to do it. So what we're going to do is kind of until our block meets our proof of work, whatever we define that to be, we're just going to keep incrementing our nuns. What this is going to do is completely change the hash of the block. So we'll be able to define what a difficulty requirement is for our hash, and then we can use our proof of work to confirm that we have met that. Okay, so <clears throat> what I want to do is define our proof of work function here. So I don't need to worry about updating nonce. I just need to return true or false if this hash is indeed below a predicted value. So what we want is a difficulty requirement. If this difficulty requirement, um, I've put some thought into this. So we're going to move kind of quickly through this. There's a lot of theory behind it that we can go into. Feel free to ask in comments and anywhere if you like, but I'm going to move kind of fast here. So we also want a function to return an integer. And it's going to... going to take a block object as its input and return an integral value for the require the difficulty requirement of this block and that's going to be useful in two different ways so let's copy that function over I'm going to need that around here this is getting kind of messy okay so how you are going to determine the difficulty of your blockchain is going to be a nuance of your particular blockchain and what effects you want that to have on your network. So in Bitcoin, for instance, um, they are sort of trying to model natural resources, gold to be in particular. The more of it you mine, the less of it there is. And the... Uh, yeah, the more energy you have to put into mining it. So they're trying to model sort of a natural resource that gets depleted over time. And so their proof of work and difficulty functions reflect that. And so do the rewards for mining the blockchain. And in how you design yours is going to depend on the goals of your blockchain. Now, the goal of my blockchain is really to reward the creation of valuable content. So I am going to tie the difficulty of a block to the amount of data that's in a block so the size of the block so the bigger the data the more difficult i want it to be for you to hash it and the value of doing that is going to be greater so it's going to take more time and produce more uh, cryptocurrency rewards to mine a youtube video than it would a tweet for example. And the idea here is that we are going to be rewarding the creation of valuable content. And that's only part of the calculation for the value of a block. I actually am uh, working out a way of additionally calculating the value of blocks that are the direct result of your block. So essentially all of the children of your block will also generate rewards for your original block considering that it was that original block that uh, sparked the subsequent blocks, we will continuously reward that first block. So with that in mind, let's work on our, our difficulty formula. I have been working on this one for quite a while. Let me see. I think the best way to show this to you is going to be in... What's the name of that? Excuse me, I might. <coughs> Sorry about that. So, okay. So, our real input, really what we're interested in here is the size of the block, okay? So, our x value, our real input is the block size. I'm having you pass in the block just as a interfacing thing. It's kind of nice if everything is dealing with block objects rather than sections of a block object. So 
we'll go ahead and give the entire block to the function. But what we want to do is have a formula where we can take the size of our block and calculate what the difficulty should be. And this took me quite a while to come up with this function. So let's take a look at it. Let me find it so I know exactly what it is. Okay. So formula is log square root of x squared plus. Okay, that's a pretty bizarre formula. Let's see why. On our x-axis, I want to, now our x-axis again is the size of our block in bytes. So let's start with uh, negative one and let's go to one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten. Ten gigabytes. Okay, so what you can see, oh well let's let's change our our y here as well. Let's make this one and forty. Okay. So what you can see here is that the fastest motion is between basically um, zero and one gigabyte. After one gigabyte, everything sort of slows down and the actual difficulty, it will it stops becoming more difficult at one gigabyte. So it's not that it stops, it will kind of, kind of continue getting more difficult as we go, but essentially this graph, the effect of it is that it makes the value of a byte uh, less and less significant the greater that the total file is. Okay, so in something that has um, 100 gigabytes, one byte is kind of insignificant. But in something that is 100 bytes, one byte is very significant. So this difficulty and value function reflects that. Also, it gives us a really nice starting point where uh, I think something... Anyway, I'm, I'm just going to copy it from my C code, but it gives us this nice clean starting point where a block of um, size 0 gives you a value of 1. So we have a nice whole 1 starting point for this formula. Okay, so I have another video where I discuss this formula at length, so just trust me that I've put a lot of thought into that formula, and we're just going to go with it for now. Okay, so that is our difficulty function. Basically return that value. This is going to return um, the, need the math library. I'm going to include uh, that math.h. Okay, and since we have that, we can now do. Lost my spot. No? Turn power. Uh, log square root of block headers size pass this double and two. Is that correct? Okay. So this is a pretty simple function. It's just basically calling um, these additional functions to give us our size. But this is going to give us a raw form of the difficulty or value of whatever block that we pass into it. Then what we need to do is actually take that difficulty and apply it to a blockchain. So this is going to give us a value you see uh, similar, well, it'll give us an output like 28 or 15 or something like that. And what does that mean? So first of all, it's going to mean in the context of our blockchain that the reward for that block is going to be 15 credits, 15 of our cryptocurrency. But also it's going to mean that the difficulty of mining that is going to be 2 to the 512 or the greatest possible value in SHA-256 minus that difficulty. That is the biggest possible hash that we can 
except for a block of that size. So that's where the difficulty comes in. We're going to have to keep incrementing the nunts, calculating the hash until we find a hash whose value is less than 2 to the 512 minus x. And that's basically how proof of work works. Easy, right? You know, makes total sense. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. So what we're going to do is say, uh, well, first we're going to need to hash the blocks. So we're going to say, well, first we need, okay, so this is interesting. Um, remember I was saying that the hash of the block, this, or no, this right here is a hexadecimal number. So ultimately the hash of something is a numeric value. And what we want to do is compare the numeric values of two different hashes. And in order to do this, we need to convert them from this raw binary format into a numeric format. Now, unfortunately in C, we are not able to handle numbers of this kind of scale. This is way too big for any native data type of C. So we're going to need to, once again, use OpenSSL. So OpenSSL comes with the big number library. So we're going to OpenSSL slash BN. Now this is called arbitrary precision. And if you think about precision, what that means is like, you can think of like number of decimal points, places, for example. How many decimal places can we store? Well, typically up to 15. Arbitrary precision means that we can store as many as we have memory to store. So we can make this as big as we want. And that is what is going to allow us to use numbers that are this absurdly large. So we have that big number library. And where are we? We're here. And so now what we need to do is, where, what's going on here? Okay, that was bizarre. Um, okay, so first we're going to need to create a couple of big numbers. So BN or big num pointer target equals BN new and big num pointer value N new. Okay, so we are creating two big num data types, and this is going to store the, uh, the max value we possibly can have for this block, and this is going to be the actual value of this block's hash. We need to create uh, these by allocating space for them, so we call this new function, which indicates to me that we're going to need to free them later. So if I do a bn free, we should see, there it is, there's a free function, so we'll need to call that in the end. But we initialize those two, so our target is that. And now we want to set target equal to the greatest possible value, which is going to be 2 to the 512th power minus our difficulty. So we need to do that as a big number. So okay, how, how, do we, how do we do this? So Okay, a big num exponent. So, interesting. Look over here. Okay, so here they, you actually have to create a control structure in order to do this sort of calculation. So we're going to need a few additional big numbers here. So we're going to need a context. Okay, we create our context. We need a base and an exponent. Okay. Okay, so one of the frustrating things here. 
um, in order to create these big numbers, I need to be a, I need everything to be a big number, even if I don't need it to be a big number. So for example, the number two, I need the number two to be represented in this big num set. And the way I need to do that is to create this variable, allocate space for it, then convert a string decimal to a big number. And then I have it. That's a really tedious way of doing things. There it is. So. Let's see, base, yes, so our base is going to be decimal to big number. I need to unplug and start charging again. So we're losing the face cam, toodaloo. Okay. We're going to store this in base, and the string we want is 2. <laughs> so that is our 2 to the what power? Our power is going to be 512 minus whatever our difficulty is. So first we're going to need to do int difficulty is going to be 512 minus... Uh, Calculate difficulty of this block. So that is our difficulty. And our exponent is going to be, so we're going to need did a character pointer, eight bytes. And we need to do sprintf. This is going to allow us to store what was a decimal here as a character string here. So we're going to put into exp, we want to put a percent %d, and then what? Uh, difficulty. So now we've got that stored in a string, and finally we can do en decimal to big number, storing it in exponent and okay so now we have two to the 512 minus our difficulty and that is our target so our target is going to be um exponent so context will be x our so it, it goes r to the power of a stored in p. So we want base power of uh, exponent stored in target. Okay? And the value is going to be much easier. So uh, we can, in fact, just define a byte digest of 64 and then do our block hash and we're going to hash our current block passing a digest and we can convert this digest directly into a big number so our bn bn to our bin to bn that's binary to big number our binary is going to be digest 64 bytes and we're going to store it in value and then we are simply going to return um, big num compare uh, the target value and what we need to do is see what that returns. One, what we are looking for. Target hash. Yeah. So that should return one. It always return one? Okay, I suppose so. So if that 
indeed works, then yeah, so so if the hash value of this block is less than our target, which is calculated as 512 minus our block difficulty as a exponent of two, then yeah, if those are if, if the hash is less than the target, then we return true. So that should be good to go. Okay, so back here in our mining function or our create block function, while not proof of work, we are going to increment those and then eventually that should satisfy it. Okay, let me see. What's next? Well, okay, so it seems that, let's, let's look at what we have so far. We find a block. Block so far has an author, a signature, a nonce, a size, and a previous block. And we have headers, and data, we have a count, and so far we've created a way to create a block. We can get the hash of a block. We can calculate the difficulty of the block based on its size. And we can prove that a block does or does not fit in our blockchain uh, according to the proof of work using those. Okay. So next up would be the signatures. So we're going to want to sign the block. So let's create that function. Okay, so int. We also want to pass it count. So we're going to use the account to sign the block. Okay, so we assume that the account is already logged in. And let's call it here. Put it down here, I think. Yep. Okay. So signing the block. This is where we are going to again use our RSA key pairs and we are going to basically put it directly or put the signature that we generate directly into uh, the block headers. So actually that's right here for us. So the first thing we want to do is clear it out. So we're going to say block headers dot uh, signature. Well, first we want to do mset. Block headers dot signature not size, and we want to set it all to zero five hundred twelve bytes. So we've cleared out that, and now we want to use the key to sign the data. And what's important here is that we are going to be signing the data of the block, not the entire block, because the block is going to undergo further changes once we hit the mining and proof of work section. Uh, where was that right here in this in this loop structure here we're going to be making changes to the block so our signature comes before this and so we need to sign it on something that's going to be constant which is going to be the data so we've done that so now we need to generate a signature so again we're going to be doing this with evpmd context but i have forgotten something forgotten to clean up we need to do some freeing here we need to free our the N free. We want to free the base. We want to free the exponent. We want to free the target. We want to free you. And we want to free the context. But before we free them, we have to get this value. So 
we'll just get that result there. And we'll return the result. Simple. Okay. So back down here, we have our signature. So we're going to need to create a context. EVP MDCTX. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, so we create our new context. And then again, we're going to initialize, update, and finalize. So this is actually cl closely related to our uh, SHA function or our hashes. So let's do all of that. So if, well, let's not do ifs yet. Let's, we'll worry about errors in a second. So EVP MD init, is that right? Digest sign. EVP digest sign. Okay, we'll give it our context, which we need to actually give a name to. And null for this PCTX, I don't actually know what that is. Our type, we want to do SHA-512, because I want to use the SHA-512 algorithm on our signatures. They're nice and secure. Let's be consistent. I don't think we're using any engines. We're not. So null. And the, uh, the key that we want to use, we want to use the private key of the user. So we can just pass in user. Oh, not user, but count private key. Okay, so that will initialize our EVP digest. And then we want to update it. So EVP digest update, sign update. And then we'll pass in the data. So here we're going to pass in the address of block data. Remember, data is defined as a single byte. So not giving it the address of would be to give it a single byte as an argument. And really, we want the address of so that we can get all of the subsequent ones. And the size of this is going to be the block headers total size minus size of block headers. And that'll give us just the total size of the data. So you can see why having to find the block header separately makes this pretty easy to work with. So after we update it, we need to arrive at our final state. And so here is where the output of this is going to go. And where we want to save the signature is going to be in block headers dot signature. And the size, again, I don't think we actually care what the size is. So we'll just create a that and we'll pass it. Since we're using 512, we know how big it is. So again, that's redundant. And yeah, so then we free the context. Okay, and let's add our error checking in. Each of those is less than and equal to zero. So if that less than or equal to and we need to remember to free it every time so that we can exit cleanly here. So free that and then we just need to turn failure. And that should be basically what we do on each of these. So if that do exactly this thing.
And finally, that. Okay, so we have all our messages. So let's print out one more for a success. Standard out. And we need our prefix. And now we can return Exit success. Okay, so this embeds a signature directly into a block. So now in our block, we have a public key. This is saying, uh, this is sort of your universal identifier for your account. This is saying who is claiming to have authored this block. And then the signature is our validation to say, yes, indeed, this person created this block. And our nonce is going to be used for our proof of work. Our size just determines the, or labels the size of our block. We have a previous hash that relates it to another block somewhere on the chain. And I think that's what we need here. So the last thing I think for now is going to be, well, we do that, so that's good to go. And let's clean up this a bit. previous block. Oops. Okay, so our create function, we are going to allocate size. We are then going to embed the author. We then, let's go ahead and sign the block. We'll pass the count, pass it the block. That should be ready to go. And our data should already be copied in there. Not at first. Okay, so, whoops, still not right. Okay, so let's, let's walk through this. So first we allocate empty space for the block. This is all blank. And then we are going to embed the public key into that header field. We're then going to put all of the data into the block and then sign the block using our public key and the data. We then embed that signature within the block and we copy the size of the block in. Let's go ahead and do that up here. So it's a little bit. There go. Okay, so once we have the data in there and our signature is on the block, we can then begin our proof of work, or excuse me, we get the hash of the previous block and copy that into the block. And then we go into our infinite loop of the proof of work. And once that is done, our block should be mined and good to go. All we'll need to do is save it to a file. Okay. Ooh wee, this is quite the project. I think I think I'm satisfied with our pro progress for today. So um, unfortunately, we did not get to any of the networking, and there's still some amount of actual this stuff to do. So we'll pick this back up again next time, and in between, I'm going to do some cleanup here to make this a little bit more readable and a little bit more organized. So. We'll pick this back up again next time. I hope you really enjoyed it. If you did, please leave a like on the stream. It really helps me out and helps me grow the channel and whatnot. Feel free to share it with your friends. Uh, as always, the code is available on GitHub, so you can follow me there and leave a like on the repository. It's my blockchain project, and here's a link to it here. Um, so yeah, you can follow me there, leave a little star on the repository, and all the good same stuff on YouTube. So. Once again, thank you for joining me here today. I really appreciate it, and I will see you next time. Toodaloo.